uh, lecture. Um, and uh, thank for everyone to, for showing up for it. It is really wonderful to see all these uh, uh, friendly faces again. Uh, this is really a, um, a repeat or somehow a repeat of a talk I gave uh, some time ago in Copenhagen for an unspecialist. And uh, for this reason, I'm a little bit embarrassed to see so many specialists uh, 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 collected here. So, um, uh, so just keep this in mind that uh, I'm basically addressing uh, not necessarily uh, specialists in operational health device. And uh, what I want to tell about is a uh, chronic bedding problem from its uh, birth in 1976. And um, I will briefly touch upon uh, the most recent development that has, of course, uh, given the um, uh, renewed interest uh, in, in this problem, uh, namely the <coughs> paper by uh, Ching Feng Yichi. Uh, Natarayan, uh, Wittig, Thomas Wittig, John Wright, and Henry Yuan, uh, who um, put on the archive in January um, a proof MIP star is equal to uh, RE uh, that, as a consequence, uh, shows that uh, conning bidding uh, has a negative answer. I should say that uh, this is a very massive uh, uh, paper uh, achievement that is currently being absorbed by the community. And I would only very uh, briefly address the content of this paper towards the end of the talk. And I know that uh, Tseng Fen Chi will give a lecture in this very seminar um, at next month. So uh, let me see. Um, I'll begin by <coughs> talking about the birth of a Connie bedding problem that comes from uh, Connie's seminal a classification paper from the 19, published in 1976, uh, where he, somewhere uh, towards the end of the paper, uh, makes this remark uh, that he somehow has a concrete two-one phenomenal algebra in mind, and he makes an approximate embedding of this one into the hyperfinite two-one factor R, and he says that apparently such an embedding ought to exist for all two-one factors because he, it does for the regular representation of the free group. So this is his remark, and this is the birth of a con embedding problem. And uh, before uh, formulating it more precisely, uh, let me just uh, remind you about phenomenal enterprise. Um, and uh, so let me just go briefly about it, that uh, it is a subalgebra of the bounded operators on a Hilbert space, um, <clears throat> which is closed under taking adjoints and also closed in the strong operator topology, which is the topology of pointwise convergence on the Hilbert space. And uh, there's an equivalent beautiful characterization of this, uh, which is a phenomenon said by Comitant theorem, that if you have a subset of B of H, which is self-adjoint, uh, then it is a phenomenon algebra, if and only if it is its own by Comitant. And the commutant is defined in this way, the set of all elements, uh, the commutant of M is a set of all elements that commute with everything in M. So this is a beautiful algebraic characterization of phenomenal algebra. So then there is a notion of hyperfiniteness uh, for phenomenal algebra, which is defined by saying a phenomenal algebra is hyperfinite if there is an increasing uh, union of finite dimensional subalgebra whose union is strong operator, uh, uh, strong, uh, is dense in the strong operator topology in the phenomenal algebra. So it is approximately finite dimensional. I think this is uh, also the word that Alan Kahn used, and maybe that is a more uh, appropriate term, approximate finite dimensional, but I will nonetheless use hyperfinite in this talk. Uh, then we have a notion of being finite, and finite does not mean finite dimensional, but it means that it has. Uh, that the phenomenon has a faithful tracial state. And a tracial state is a positive linear functional uh, who has a trace property that the trace of ST is equal to the trace of TS for all pairs of elements S and T in the phenomenon algebra. So you will note, for example, that matrix algebras uh, have a faithful tracial state, and it is a non trivial fact that there are infinite dimensional algebras with that property as well. And in fact, if we have a, a phenomenal algebra which has a faithful facial state and has no finite dimensional representation, then it is of type 2, 1. 
And uh, moreover, a phenomenal device a factor, if the center, which is defined in this way, uh, <clears throat> everything that commutes with everything else, is just the trivial one, meaning all scalar multiples of the identity. And uh, uh, with these things in place, uh, we can uh, define the hyperfinite to one factor, or at least say what it is, it is the unique hyperfinite to one factor. So there's one and only one with that property and uniqueness was proven by uh, Murray and von Neumann in uh, their papers uh, where they established the theory of phenomenal algebras. And the paper I mentioned before uh, <clears throat> uh, of Alan Kahn from uh, 1976, uh, he uh, almost completes the classification of hyperfinite factors in that he proves that there's a unique hyperfinite factor of type two infinity, and also a unique hyperfinite two one factor, um, the power factors of type three lambda for lambda strictly between zero and one. And uh, in the case of uh, type three zero, he's proved that the hyperfinite factors are classified by the so-called flow of weights, and there are uncountably many of those. And um, he then also proved uh, that being hyperfinite is the same thing as being objective. And moreover, he gave a number of equivalent conditions for a 2-1 factor to be isomorphic to the hyperfinite 2-1 factor. And it was in fact in this last bit here uh, where he uh, came upon uh, this need for embedding a certain 2-1 um, phenomenal approximately into the hyperfinite two one factor. So this quotation I mentioned to you before arises precisely in the proof of this latter bit. To kind of round off uh, the classification of phenomenal enterprise, it was completed nine years after uh, Alan Kahn's paper in 1985 by Uwe Horo, uh, who proved that uh, there is a unique uh, hyperfinite factor of type three one. And uh, let, um, let, me, let me now move on to the formulation of the kind embedding problem. So there's uh, this abstract formulation, uh, which says, ask that does every separable finite phenomenal algebra uh, admit an embedding into the alter power of our omega? So the alter power is uh, you take all bounded sequences of elements for the hyperfinite factor, and then you work out by sequences tending to zero in two norm along some ultra filter, uh, free ultra filter. And the two norm is with respect to the trace, and uh, that is uh, the trace on the hyperfinite two one factor. And uh, by the way, if you just look at this, uh, that this object here, that this quotient even is a phenomenal algebra, is not a trivial fact, but it is true. This does happen to be a phenomenal algebra, but only when this is a free ultra filter. Um, uh, so, um, so while this is a very clean way of phrasing it, it may not be the most intuitive one. Uh, and uh, so here is another one, and you can paraphrase it in the following way. Does every finite phenomenal algebra uh, in, and here we specify a trace on it, admit an approximate embedding into a matrix algebra. And uh, this can be formulated in different ways. I've been <laughs> struggling a little bit to find the best possible way and decided to go back to exactly the way that Alan Kahn defined it himself in that paper from 1976, uh, which is, a, in my opinion, a very clean way and useful way of doing it, basically saying that whenever you have uh, unitaries, a finite set of unitaries in your given finite phenomenal algebra, then they can be replicated by unitaries in a certain matrix algebra replicated in the way that whenever you take moments of these unitaries here, uh, so these are product of these unitaries, powers of these unitaries, the powers can be uh, integers. Uh, and these words, the length of these words, there's a bound of them, uh, and that bound is given by this number capital N. So that if you take the trace of all these words, then they are close to taking the trace in the n by n matrices of the corresponding words of the unitaries in the matrices. So in other words, these unitaries in the matrices replicate exactly the behavior of the unitaries in n. 
So this is a very clean way of putting it. Of course, there are lots of quantifiers, but I think the idea nonetheless is uh, clear. And uh, uh, I should also say that you could reformulate in such a way that there exists somehow an approximate uh, map from, or a map from M into matrices, which approximately is a homomorphism. But one has to be careful about formulating precisely correct. Let me mention another small thing that uh, here we specifically mentioned the trace. Here, the trace was not mentioned. And um, you could ask here, you could uh, choose a trace on M. And then you could ask that the embedding should be trace preserving. That would be, a, on the face of it, a stronger requirement. As it turned out, it is the same. It does not change uh, the val validity of the statement here. And the reason is, whenever you have a finite phenomenal algebra with a specified uh, trace, that it, then it embeds trace preservingly into a 2-1 factor. And then you can put that 2-1 factor into our omega, and therefore you have a trace preserving mapping embedding if all you know is that you can embed 2-1 factors into our omega. Okay, so uh, in other words, um, kind of embedding says, um, do all finite phenomenal algebras, can they be approximated by matrix algebras? And uh, this is illustrated uh, beautifully in a survey uh, paper in the notices from uh, 2016 by Reisa and Santiago. And uh, with a beautiful title, Are We Living in the Matrix? And uh, I so, certainly recommend you uh, to read this paper. And I think that uh, you can see uh, these uh, drawings here. I think they are matrices. And if you take the limit of these drawings, you get precisely the hyperfinite uh, 2 1 factor R. So R is the limit of these matrices you see here. So is everything a matrix? That's the question. And uh, examples of uh, finite phenomenal algebras uh, come from groups, uh, an important class of examples. So if you have a discrete, uh, <clears throat> countably uh, infinite group, then you can consider its left regular representation um, where a group element acts on uh, the standard orthonormal basis for little l2 of gamma. Uh, just indexed by the group element by left translation. So this gives you a permutation unitary, and this left regular representation extends to a star representation of the group ring um, into the bounded operators on little l2 of gamma. And the image of this, if you take the strong operator closure of it, uh, gives you a phenomenal algebra, and this we call L of gamma, the phenomenal algebra associated with gamma. And uh, that can independently be realized by just taking the image of this map. So this is just a collection of unitaries and taking the bicommutant of that. So by the bicommutant theorem, these are the same. So this is a phenomenal algebra and it happens to have a trace, namely if you apply any of the standard orthonormal vectors in the standard orthonormal basis, for example, the one corresponding to the neutral element, and if you apply the corresponding uh, vector state, then that gives you a trace as it turns out. One can check this as a trace, as it, and it is a, even a faithful tracial state. So L of gamma is a finite phenomenal algebra. Moreover, it is a true one factor, precisely if the group is ICC, all, all non-trivial conjugacy classes are infinite. And um, it is hyperfinite, if and only if the group is amenable. Okay. So this was a little brush up on um, the phenomenal algebra side of it. And uh, let me um, mention uh, fairly briefly uh, some relations of uh, con embedding to group theory. So there are two approximation properties I here would like to mention for countable discrete groups. And uh, one of them being that the group is suffix uh, after Gromov. And uh, you can put it this way, a group is uh, gamma is suffix if it admits an approximate embedding into the symmetric group Sn. So this means that there is a map phi from the group gamma into the symmetric group Sn on in letters, uh, which approximately uh, is multiplicative, uh, phrased in this way. And uh, the distance we measure by is the so-called Hamming metric where two permutations are close together if they agree on almost all letters and they're far apart if they disagree on almost uh, all letters. 
So these two will agree on almost all letters, uh, these two elements here. And um, we also want them, we want this map to be very injective, meaning that if you have two distinct group elements, then they should be far away, as far away as possible, almost um, given by this condition here. Let me just uh, quickly mention that uh, if you took gamma to be SN itself and this to be the identity map, then that would not satisfy the second condition. However, if you take any finite group and let it act on itself um, by permutations, uh, sorry, if you let it act on permutations of itself just by uh, multiplying from the left, uh, then you get something which satisfies uh, these two conditions in even exactly with epsilon equal to zero. So finite groups are subject. And uh, then we have a notion of hyperlinearity, uh, which says that the uh, group is uh, hyperlinear if it emits an approximate embedding into the unitary group um, of uh, n by n matrices, so unitary group un of n by n matrices. And by this, uh, we mean, again, that there is a group homomorphism from the group into the unitary group, um, which is almost multiplicative, and now it is with respect to the two-norm uh, as we mentioned before, the two norm with respect to the trace on the n by n matrices. And then we also want the group elements, uh, the images of group elements corresponding to distinct, uh, we have distinct elements uh, G and H, then these should be almost orthogonal. They should be far apart, almost orthogonal. Um, so in a sense, a hyperlinearity on the face of it is unrelated to linearity. Uh, since linear groups are not automatically, will not automatically satisfy this property and vice versa, uh, hyperlinearity will not imply linearity. But uh, we shall see that linear groups in fact are hyperlinear. And uh, one could perhaps also argue that instead of calling them hyperlinear, one should find another name, maybe groups with a, a con embedding property perhaps, uh, but uh, let that be. There is a tradition for calling them hyperlinear. This um, number here, root 2 uh, minus epsilon root 2 is the largest possible number we could have, could be replaced by any other fixed number of delta um, in the interval from 0 to, to square root of 2. So these are two approximation properties for discrete groups. And uh, sophisticity came out of the Gottschank's uh, surjectivity projector. And that uh, deals with uh, this uh, Bernoulli shift here on n letters, uh, where you take a group and take the uh, Cartesian product of uh, the n letter uh, space um, with itself. Um, and uh, then, <coughs> so this is a Cantor set, and then you uh, just consider the shift where you shift all elements once to the right. So this is a shift space, and uh, this shift space is uh, yeah, very interesting. There's a lot of dynamical system that lives here. And for example, all uh, sim symbolic dynamical systems uh, live in these shift spaces. So this is somehow the mother of all symbolic dynamical systems. And uh, as uh, people who have been working with this will know very well, uh, this is very, very far away from being a minimal uh, dynamical system. It has tons and tons of closed invariant subspaces. But um, uh, the question here is, are any of those closed subspaces isomorphic to the original space itself? And uh, this co conjecture says that that is not the case, that the only of these closed invariant subspaces that is isomorphic to the original one is the original one itself. So this is uh, Gaussian's uh, conjunctivity conjecture, and one can phrase that perhaps in a more intuitive way by saying that every injective Self map of this Cantor set, which is gamma preserving, is necessarily surjective. And uh, Gomer was able to confirm this conjecture in the case of Sophic groups. So, of course, uh, then uh, the question was are all groups Sophic? And we can also ask are all groups hyperlinear? And uh, let us just take uh, some. Um, uh, <clears throat> conditions uh, for groups and see how they're related. And uh, uh, here we have, if we have a linear finitely generated group, then by uh, the theorem of Malchev, uh, they are all residually finite. Residually finite group are locally embedded, embeddable into finite groups. And uh, all those groups are suffix. So here we have a chain of 
uh, implications. If you are amenable, you're also Sophic, and all Sophic books are hyperlinear. And uh, one can also make us uh, <clears throat> show, use this to show that all linear groups are Sophic. It's not true that all linear groups are absolutely finite, but all linear groups are Sophic because this class is closed under direct limits. Okay, and um, <clears throat> uh, Florin Radlesco, I think I saw his saw him just a, a moment ago, uh, proved that um, uh, a group gamma is uh, hyperlinear if and only if its phenomenal algebra embeds into R omega. In other words, the phenomenal algebra uh, satisfies the conjugating condition. Hence, um, <clears throat> if uh, we had an affirmative answer to the conjugating problem, we would know that all groups are hyperlinear, but we would not necessarily know if they're also sophic. While on the other hand, with a negative answer uh, to the kind embedding problem, you wouldn't really know neither if all groups are, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily know if they exist a non-hyperlinear group, or for that matter, non-sophic group, because uh, the counterexample, the example of the 2-1 uh, phenomena or the 2-1 factor, uh, that will not embed into our omega may not necessarily be a group phenomenon algebra. So there is still uh, some missing uh, piece here. Uh, so the relation between current embedding and groups certainly exists, but it's not a complete one-to-one uh, -one, uh, relation. So we still have things to understand when it comes to groups. Uh, let me then move on to um, Kirchberg's theorem, and Kirchberg's theorem are really what uh, connects together um, uh, <clears throat> current embedding problem to Cyrilson's conjecture, and Cyrilson's conjecture is then uh, what <clears throat> connects to the uh, recent paper um, uh, that um, <clears throat> they're showing uh, that current embedding uh, problem has a negative answer. And um, so uh, let me uh, just um, uh, here give some, uh, give this background information that um, we are going to, um, uh, first of all, consider the free group with countably infinitely many generators that we denoted by F infinity. To a group, we can also associate a ceased algebra. In fact, we can associate several ceased algebras, but we consider this one, which is the universal ceased algebra of the group. Um, and that, you can also, this particular one, you can view as a universal C style algebra generated by a sequence of unitaries. So whenever you have a sequence of unitaries, you can just take the C style algebra generated by those, and that will be a quotient of this C style algebra here. So this is universal C style algebra generated by a sequence of unitaries. Uh, so then we have a notion of tensor products. And um, if we have two unital C style algebras, A and B, we can form various tensor products, in particular two. One of them is the minimal tensor product, which is obtained by um, uh, taking, viewing A as sitting inside the boundary operators on, on a Hilbert space H, and the other one as sitting on the boundary operators on another Hilbert space K. And then um, the minimal tensor product will then be um, sitting inside the boundary operators on the tensor product H tensor K, and in fact, it will be uh, the closure of the algebraic tensor product A tensor B residing naturally inside of B of H tensor K. So you somehow just take the completion of the algebraic tensor product in that Hilbert space, in this representation, in the spatial representation. On the other hand, uh, we also have the maximal tensor product, and this is the universal C star algebra generated by commuting copies of the C star algebras A and B. And in general, uh, the maximal is larger than the minimal in the sense that there is a canonical subjection from the maximal tensor product to the minimal tensor product. And this subjection is sometimes injective. If it is injective, we say that the two are equal. And that is, for example, the case if uh, both, if A or B, one of them is nuclear. But it's not true in general. And then uh, coming to uh, Kiersberg's um, uh, remarkable paper uh, from uh, 93, published in Inventionis, uh, um, 
we have the following results. So he reformulates, uh, I mean, he has really tons and tons of conditions which he proves are equivalent, and uh, this is only a, a small part of it. Um, I mean, really, uh, he studies extensively the local lifting property and Lance's weak expectation property. Um, and uh, so using this, uh, one of the things he proves is that uh, the conning betting problem has a positive answer if and only if uh, if you take the C starts bar of the free group and if you eliminate generators, tensor itself, algebraic tensor product, that this algebraic tensor product has a unique C star norm. In other words, that the min tensor product and the max tensor product are the same. So it proves that this is equivalent to the kind embedding problem. That is also equivalent to C star F infinity having Lance's weak expectation property. So what we know is that uh, B of H has Lance's uh, weak expectation property and uh, C star F infinity has a so-called local, in, in fact, it has a lifting property, LP. And uh, he can show that if you have a C star algebra with a lifting property or local lifting property and one with a weak expectation property, then the min and the max tensor product are the same. So he knows that these two tensor products are equal and he wonders what about this and what about this? if you take uh, C star F infinity with itself and what about if you take B of H with itself. So as I said, he proves that uh, the first thing here is equivalent to quantum embedding problem and he asks whether these are the same with B of H and B of H and that was answered in the negative by Mai Jung, whom who I also saw here and uh, Gilles Pichet um, using uh, a non-commutative version of uh, the Bodendieck inequality. Uh, let me also mention um, that um, there is a relation. I mean, if you look to this thing about uh, min and max uh, tensor product of uh, Hooke's least algebra, mm -hmm. in fact, you can do it for other least algebra as well, but let us just look at Hooke's least algebra, then the max and the min are the same if it is the case that the C star algebra of the group gamma cross lambda, and in fact, this C star algebra is just the same as this one here, is just another way of putting it. If this C star algebra has a faithful trace, then the min and the max are the same. And this is also one thing that enters into uh, Kiersberg's paper. Uh, in fact, he proves that the uh, kind embedding is equivalent to um, uh, the fact that C star SL2Z cross SL2Z has a faithful trace. And uh, related to this, uh, Beck approved in 07, also in Evan Jonas, that uh, if you take the C star algebra of SLN set, this does not have a faithful trace when n is greater or equal to 3. If Becker had proven instead that SLN set had a faithful trace, for, for example, n equal 4, then he would also have proven that Kohn embedding problem had an affirmative answer. Okay. And uh, another uh, formulation which is very concrete uh, that is also contained in Kiersberg's paper, and this is in fact how he arrives at the proof of this theorem I mentioned earlier uh, on the previous slide, uh, is considering these correlation matrices. So what you do is uh, you fix an n and then you consider certain classes of n by n matrices arising from unitaries. So in the first instance, uh, what we do is we consider n tuples of unitaries in matrices, k by k matrices, and then we take u days u days star u i and take the normalized trace of that, and that gives you an n by n matrix. And you do that for all uh, such n tuples of unitaries and for all possible values of k, and then you get a collection of matrices, and this collection we call f matrix n. You could also do the same way instead of taking full matrix algebras, you just take finite dimensional C star algebras with some trace. A finite dimensional C star algebra is just a direct sum of uh, full matrix algebras. So this is a more general situation, and then you do the same thing. And then uh, most generally, you can take n tuples of unitaries in any finite phenomenal algebra with a specified trace tau. And then you can again consider these n by n matrices arising from uh, taking trace of u j star uh, u i. So this gives you another collection of n by n matrices. And these um, three uh, collections are filtered as follows, uh, that this is the smallest set, then comes uh, 
the one from finite dimensional algebra is, and this is the general one. All these sets are equal and easy to describe in the case when n equals two. So what Kirchberg can uh, uh, proved was that Kahn and Benning problem is the same thing as saying that um, this set here, if matrix is dense in uh, this set here, Gn. This uh, <clears throat> thing was formalized uh, later by uh, Dykeman and Yushchenko, who used that uh, to yeah, um, make an attempt to prove Kahn embedding um, using this uh, <coughs> using this setup here. And um, I should uh, let's see. I should also say that in one direction, if we knew that Kahn embedding was correct, then we would know that all these um, collation uh, we see here can be approximated by matrices. So that was really one of the conditions we saw, uh, the equivalent conditions of Kahn embedding problem in the beginning of the talk, uh, that in particular you can approximate any such moments here by moments coming off uh, from mat unitaries and matrices. So in one direction, if Kahn embedding is uh, true, then this holds that is already known. It is the other direction, which is uh, the content of Kiersberg's theorem. I should also mention that uh, Magdalena Musat uh, and myself, and I should, by the way, also mention that Magdalena uh, is uh, sort of a co-author of these slides. I mean, these are slides taken from talks that she has been giving and I've been giving, so we sort of merged them together. So we are co-authors on this talk, and uh, we are also co-authors on a paper where we uh, prove that um, this set here is neither convex nor closed when n is greater than equal to three, and if we take this set here that is not closed when n is greater than or equal to 11. And this again we use to prove a statement about factorizable maps that I will not address further in this talk. And um, let me just see, I can, I may wanna, I can <coughs> you can mention this as well. Uh, so there is, um, if we look at this set here, uh, correlation matrices coming from matrices, uh, then, um, so this is a very concrete set in principle of uh, n by n matrices and uh, one could ask the question that suppose we have a given n by n matrix, does it belong to this set or does it belong, uh, does, does it belong to this set within a certain tolerance epsilon? Is it epsilon away from this set? So can we decide that? And um, so a compactness argument shows uh, that uh, there exists a certain number, uh, capital N, that depends on little n, the size of the matrix and the tolerance epsilon, uh, so that uh, every element uh, in this set F matrix N is contained in the set uh, where we take all uh, correlation matrices arising from unitaries belonging to matrices of size K, where K goes from one to N. So K is less than or equal to capital N. So this set here is epsilon dense in this set for a sufficiently large capital N, and that capital N is this one here. So the problem here is, can we give an upper bound of this capital N in terms of, supposing N is fixed, can we do it in terms of epsilon? How does this behave with epsilon? And uh, we uh, know from uh, Slavstar and Vidic that um, using uh, um, <clears throat> a hyperfinite profile of groups, that uh, there is a lower bound for this number, which is very large. It increases uh, with e to the power of one over epsilon. So that's a lower bound for this number. And so far, uh, I have not heard of anyone proving an upper bound for this number. So this is somehow an undecidability. Uh, or decidability question that remains open. I wonder, David, are there any questions or I just move on? I've, I've received no questions so far, but uh, maybe we should ask generally if anybody would like to comment at this point or ask a question. A question. Okay. Is, so is that Marius, I think? Back one slide. Could it be that this function n of n epsilon is not computable or something like this? If I mean, I mean, it certainly could be. Uh, I, I mean, that is definitely a possibility. Yes. 
and that this is even related to the negative solution of quantum embedding? I, 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 I definitely think so, yes. I definitely think there's a relation, yes. Thanks. Uh, are there any more comments or questions before Miko carries on? Okay, if not, uh, Mikkel can proceed. Okay, so then I will, um, <clears throat> the second last uh, section will be tying it up with uh, Tyrosin conjecture. And uh, the background for Tyrosin conjecture uh, come from the uh, einstein uh, fodolsky rosen paradox, uh, where you consider the situation of having Alice and Bob residing in spatially separated labs. And uh, so they each receive a quantum source and the quantum source could perhaps be a pair of particles with opposite spin sent from the source and one particle in each direction. Alice gets one of the particle and Bob gets the other particle. And then perhaps what they could do is to measure the spin of the particle they receive in various directions. And the spin can be up and down. And for example, if Alice uh, measures spin up in, in a certain direction and Bob measures the same thing in the same direction, uh, he will get the opposite measurement. And the trouble is, or the question is, what happens if he measures at a slightly different angle? How are they then correlated? And uh, of course, uh, the, the paradox behind this is that if Alice measures in a certain direction, in a certain spin, then that will immediately influence Bob measurements, even though the uh, labs are separated in such a way that no information seems to be you would not be able to send any information from Alice to Bob uh, in the amount of, I mean, instantly. So, so this is, uh, this is um, the seemingly paradox um, in this story. And um, so let us uh, look at uh, this and um, try to quantify it. And also this whole setup is uh, the setup, I mean, somehow one of the crucial ingredients in quantum information theory. So, um, so we uh, imagine now that Alice and Bob both measure uh, any one of n possible observables and the observables could for example be measuring the spin in n different directions and each observable has k possible outcomes and k in this case could for example be two and then uh, the probability that you get outcome x and y uh, when measuring uh, observable a and b respectively is denoted in this way p a b comma x y so this is the probability of that measurement. And uh, what Einstein uh, proposed was that uh, maybe um, uh, there is a classical explanation behind these probabilities and uh, there is a set of hidden variables, uh, a probability space called omega with a probability measure mu, uh, so that uh, this probability uh, ab comma xy is simply just uh, the measure of the event uh, which is the event is just that uh, Alice measures x when measures outcome x when measuring observable a and Bob measures outcome y when measuring observable b and then you just take uh, the, int the intersection and then take the probability of this the measure of this set here. So this is the classical uh, way that you could interpret such a probability. So it comes again here uh, that is a classical model. So the quantum model is that instead of uh, having a probability space, a commutative space, we replace it by a non-commutative space, and the non-commutative space is bounded operators on the Hilbert space. More specifically, um, instead of having partitions, we have a k-tuple of projections on the Hilbert space adding up to the identity. This is the replacement of a partition. This is a non-commutative partition. And then the two quantum models for uh, these probabilities will be given uh, maybe let's say the commutativity first, that there is a Hilbert space, a common Hilbert space for Alice and Bob, and they have commuting projection valued measures uh, denoting uh, PAX and uh, QBY, and they have one for each observable. Um, and then there's a unit vector psi in the Hilbert space, so that this probability is given by um, applying this operator, which is a positive operator, the true projections commuter, this positive operator applied to uh, this uh, vector here. So this is the quantum probability under the assumption of commutativity of the variables. 
another formulation uh, would be that instead of having the shared helper space, then Alice has her own helper space HA and Bob has his uh, HB. And um, protection valued measures are, belong to their respective helper spaces, uh, Alice is to HA and Bob's to HB. And we have a unit vector in the tensor product of the helper spaces so that the probabilities are given by this formula here. Where we, instead of taking the product of commuting projections, take the tensor product of projections. So this is a tensor product uh, picture of a probability. And given these three models, uh, maybe I just show it again so you can uh, see we have this model, the classical commuting and tensor. Given these three models, um, we can uh, form uh, the following convex sets. The classical one where we just consider all measure spaces and all sets of partitions described before. And then for each of those, you consider uh, this set of matrices is NK by NK matrices, uh, where for all A and X and B and Y, we have these numbers and then we organize it as a matrix. So it is really just a set of um, nk times nk numbers organized as a matrix. So we just take the union of all these matrices as we run through all probability spaces and all possible partitions. Then we do the same thing in the uh, quantum spatial case where uh, we consider uh, protection valued measures on helper spaces HA and HB respectively, all possible ones and all possible unit vectors, and then we consider these probabilities. And we take the collection of all such matrices. And then this uh, set here, as it turns out, we need not be closed. In fact, it isn't closed, so we take the closure of that set, and that is this set here, CQA, A for approximation. And then we take the commuting picture, and that is uh, where, again, we consider uh, all helper spaces, all P uh, projection valued measures, which are commuting with each other, and then we all unit vectors, psi in H, and then we consider the corresponding probabilities and take the union of all of them. So this gives rise to four different uh, convex sets of matrices, and they are nested as follows, as listed here. And um, <clears throat> defining um, the EPR uh, paradox, or their model, uh, their suggestion of hidden variables uh, was done first by mathematically by Bill, uh, who gave an equality uh, showing that these two sets are mathematically different. And that was later physically, uh, experimentally verified by aspects showing that they, in fact, also in the physical world, these two sets are different. So we can, <clears throat> so the model of a hidden variable is not a correct physical uh, model. It cannot be. Tsirilson uh, conjectured uh, that these two sets, uh, the one, the commuting picture and the closure of the tensor product picture, that these are identical. In fact, that's not really what he did. What he did was he proved that they are equal. And, um, and then later he was asked, how do you really see that? And then he had to reply back, well, he didn't quite see it. So maybe uh, he was a little bit quick to jump to that conclusion. And quite possibly uh, what he might have done would be to think that if the Hilbert spaces were finite dimensional, so let us say here, so if we restrict to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, then in fact, uh, these two spaces here are identical. So in the finite dimensional situation, they are identical. But in the infinite dimensional case, uh, it then became from a, it be transferred from a theorem to being a conjecture or question. Are these two sets equal? And that is now known as Sirilson's conjecture. And uh, so here we have the <clears throat> sets again, and this is Sirilson's conjecture. And then Slavstra, the one of the first uh, recent uh, development in this story was that he proved that uh, this set the spatial set and the commuting set, these sets here are different for very large N and K and he used some uh, uh, sophisticated group theory to arrive at this condition. And these are for very large values of N and K. Uh, of course, this already gave a suspicion that maybe now we have a, um, 
we can disprove Cyril's conjecture. And as we will see, Cyril's conjecture is related to current embedding problem. Uh, in fact, they're equivalent, so then also we will know about current embedding. But as it turns out, uh, he proved that these are different, and later he proved that, in fact, um, this set here, the spatial set, is not closed. So it is these two sets which are different, and he could not say whether these two are the same or not. So he could uh, prove, verify that these are uh, different, and uh, Dijk and Mabals and Prakash proved uh, in 2017 uh, that this set here, even for very small values of n and k, uh, n equal 5 and k equal 2, is not closed. The proof uses non-local quantum games. Uh, so um, uh, what I want to talk about here and justify is uh, the res uh, result uh, proven by um, different groups of people, uh, Taka Usava, uh, Fritz and Marius Junge with his co-authors, that Sillerson conjecture and coin embedding problem in fact are equivalent. So a negative problem to a coin embedding problem will show us that these two sets are different and hence all of these sets are different. There's strict inequality all three places. So I will talk a little bit about uh, the <clears throat> why this is true. And um, so uh, this goes back to uh, Kirchberg's uh, theorem and it goes back to some uh, group theory and group C stratifiers. So we are considering uh, here set mod n that is a cyclic group of order n. And in fact, what we do is we take k such k covers of that group and we take their free product. That gives you a group gamma. If you take the C star algebra of set n, this is an abelian group. It has order n. So this C star algebra is an abelian C star algebra of dimension n. And any such is just direct sum of n copies of the complex numbers. So in other words, it is generated by projections E1 through En, which are pairwise orthogonal and add up to the identity. So each of these C star algebra are very well understood. The C star algebra uh, of the group gamma is then taking this C star algebra and then taking the unital universal free product of itself uh, k times, k copies of itself. Okay, uh, so we have this C star algebra in place and then um, we can take inside of this C star algebra, we can consider the projection E sub A X and that is just the projection E sub A in this C star algebra. Um, so there's the eighth projection here in the X uh, free factor here. So if X is two, it belongs here. So this, as so we have a collection of projection in this C star algebra. So if now we have projection valued measures, a collection of them, um, uh, we have, uh, say we have, uh, we have K of them, uh, then uh, we get a star homomorphism from this C star algebra, C star algebra of gamma into B of H, which maps the projection uh, E A X to P A X. And uh, it is simply because of these projection valued measures, these projections are exactly somehow the universal ones which are pairwise orthogonal adding up to one precisely as a projection value measure. And otherwise they're free from each other, so that's why we get uh, such a star homomorphism. So we can say that uh, a collection of uh, projection valued measures can always be viewed as an image uh, of C star of gamma. And if we have two sets of such uh, commuting uh, projection valued measures, uh, then they can be uh, arrived at by the image of taking this C star algebra, taking the max tensor product of itself into B of H. And then uh, this uh, map should send uh, the tensor product just to the product of the two. So by the universal property of maximal tensor product, this is the maximal commuting C star algebra containing C star two covers of C star of gamma, we get a map like this one here. So in this way, uh, if we go down to the computing picture, we can realize uh, all um, uh, the possible um, correlation matrices uh, described in the previous slide uh, described, uh, described here. All of these sets here can now be described as taking any state on this uh, C-star algebra and applying it to uh, this tensor particle projections because this quantity here will be precisely this quantity. 
and the state uh, phi is just the vector state psi given by the vector psi. And similarly, uh, if we take the uh, closure of the uh, spatial situation, then we get the same thing, uh, except now we take states on the minimal tensor product. So this was the realization of uh, Fritz uh, and independently Jung and his uh, co-authors that you can realize these sets of correlation matrices in this way using uh, the min and the max tensor product of this particular proof six And uh, this is repeated here again. So uh, the theorem that is then obtained, and that is using Kirchberg and Fritz and Junge and Usaba, is that um, these four statements are the same. That the max and the min tensor product of C star gamma with itself are the same. Uh, the same holds for the free group and infinitely many generators. Generators, con embedding has a positive answer, and Sirosum conjecture is true. The theorem by Fritz uh, and Junge shows certainly that if one is true, uh, oops, if one is true, then four is true. Uh, if these two are the same, then of course these two sets are the same. And uh, two and three are equivalent by uh, Kirchberg's theorem. Four implies one that was the last uh, uh, thing that was proven, and that was proven by Usava. And um, I think that both uh, Fritz and, uh, and Junge realized that uh, <clears throat> one can go from one to three uh, via two or in the same way as um, <clears throat> you prove two implies three. Okay, so in this way we have related a uh, kind of bedding problem to Sirolson conjecture via Kirchberg's uh, deep theorems. And uh, that brings us uh, close to the end of the story and also close to the end of my talk uh, where uh, we are now arriving at uh, the paper put at the archive in January uh, by Jing Feng Ji and Data Yan and Thomas Wittig, John Wright and Henry Yuan, uh, showing using um, quantum complexity theory uh, that um, <clears throat> uh, uh, that the class MIP star uh, contains an undecidable language, and using this, I can conclude that Sirolson's conjecture is. Um, uh, has a negative answer and hence also quite embedding. And as I said, uh, this is a very uh, deep and complex uh, paper and uh, the world is, as we are speaking, digesting and are trying to understand this paper. I will uh, just end the talk by showing two slides from uh, a lecture that uh, Yuen gave in Austin um, uh, about a uh, yeah, that was uh, almost uh, two months ago and um, I think that was, I think it was April 10, not March 10. I think I, I got that wrong. I think it was last month. Um, so, uh, so this is, and, and I'm sure that um, you hear in the next month, we will hear more about this uh, from uh, Chen Fen Ji when he explains uh, the paper. So uh, just to give a very rough outline, then um, <clears throat> the main result they have is that they have a way of assigning uh, to each Turing machine, a game um, um, uh, a game at gamma m uh, gm uh, with the property that if the Turing machine falls then the quantum value of the game is equal to one and if it does not fall then the quantum value of the game is less equal to a half and quantum refers to uh, we have a certain players that are involved in the game and it, it refers to um, the situation that like in the case uh, we saw before that they can share an entangled state. And then uh, the idea is that um, um, Turing has shown that there's no algorithm that can solve the holding problem. So hence uh, there can be no algorithm deciding whether this number here is um, uh, equal to one plus minus epsilon. So then uh, what they can show is that um, <clears throat> there are different ways, so you can, uh, uh, there are different uh, rules of the game. There's uh, Q refers to um, the situation where you have a tensor product situation and QC where you have the commuting um, 
commuting operator system. And uh, so this gives you two values of the game. And this value here can be approximated from above and this value can be approximated from below. And uh, if they were equal, you could approximate them both from above and below. And in this way, you would be able to uh, decide uh, within epsilon uh, whether uh, this value is uh, one or not. And that would conflict with a, a non-algorithm of the uh, holding problem. So this way they can decide that these are different and hence that these numbers are different and hence that con that Tilson's problem uh, has a negative answer and that the con embedding conjecture has a negative answer. I will not enter into details. Uh, what I really wanted to do here was just to give a very, very uh, thin and brief indication of how they are proof uh, relates to and ties up with Tillerson's conjecture. And uh, so with this, uh, I'm ending my talk. And uh, so what I wanted you to, uh, what I wanted to convey in this talk was somehow this 45 year journey, I think a beautiful journey of con embedding uh, problem arising from a pure uh, phenomenal algebra uh, problem, uh, the classification of um, hyperfinite uh, factors and via uh, group theory and uh, the deep theorems of Kirchberg to uh, quantum information theory and then to uh, this uh, work that uh, we are going to uh, hear more about next month. So I'll end here. I thank you.